welcome to Cinema Talk, where we don't only just talk about cinema and movies, we talk about other things, like music, for example. I'm your host, Mike Mixtape, and today, oh boy, we got a doozy of a guest here. One of my favorites on YouTube, he's a great YouTube musician, uh, his name is Pogo, also known as Nick. Thanks for coming on, Nick. Hey there, Mike, thanks for having me, man. How's your day going so far? Oh, really good, man. How was your day? Oh, not too bad, yeah. Uh, tried to double quarter pounder for the first time today. It's a hell of a lot of beef on one burger. <laughs> really? Oh, Ooh, yeah. You guys call it a quarter pounder with cheese, though, which yeah. I don't understand why you'd want one without cheese. Cheese is amazing. I mean, I'm I'm from the state of Wisconsin. We're known for our cheese. We love our cheese. Right. Right. Cheese yeah, it's amazing. Really an option to take it out. <laughs> I always just call it hamburger, you know, without the cheese. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's right. Actually, I've I found out not long ago that hamburger, it's called the hamburger because it uh, it came from a place called Hamburg, a long time ago. That is true. Uh, yeah, I, I used to think it's because it, it, it's, I used to think it's because it had ham in it or something like that back in the day. Which of course, yeah, isn't true at all. <laughs> yeah, it's not. Uh, mm -hmm. Good, good, good. So what I normally do is start off with a question of going into your childhood a bit. What was your first memory when it comes to movies and actually, especially with music? Well, it's kind of a double whammy because the first movies my folks showed me were The King and I and Oliver. Oh, okay. So both musicals, both very good musicals back in the day when musicals were done right. Back in the day when people knew how to make musicals. It's a totally dead genre now. Nobody knows what they're doing. But um, The King and I... Let me see here. So that was 1956 um, with Deborah Kerr. Really great film. And, of course, it had Yul Brenner in there as well. And then Oliver, I think it's 1967-ish. And I just remember being... I, I watched the tapes over so many times because I just loved the music. I loved the way that it communicated story with melody. I, that just blew me away. And so I wanted to be a circus performer for the longest time. <laughs> and... Uh, Thank God that didn't happen. Uh, yeah, it's interesting because musicals, yeah, are, is kind of a sort of a dying breed because there's not a lot of good ones yep. anymore. You gotta no. go, go back to the greats, you know. For me, it was like sing, right. for me recently, not like too recently, but Singing in the Rain is a great example of that too because that's a great that's fucking, right. fucking Absolutely musical. Absolutely amazing. Absolutely yep. amazing. So checking out those musicals back in the day. It's just great to look at, especially from a film standpoint and music-wise. Um, That's right, yeah. When it comes to music, how did you get into music? Did you play any instruments? What did you? How did you get into music in general? Well, my first experience was drumming. We had a band when I was around 10 years old. Mm. And our teachers would let us take time off school so we could go and practice, so we could get into the talent quest. And I remember rummaging through the dictionary trying to find interesting words so we could call ourselves something cool. So we arrived at minor conflict. <laughs> and uh, being 10 years old, you know, we don't know what the hell we're doing. <laughs> but this was back in New Zealand, and this was a lot of fun. We got into talent quests all over the country, and we got on the front page, front page of the newspaper. Have you ever seen that movie uh, School of Rock with Jack Black? Yep. It's, yeah, it's almost that exact scenario, just without an awesome actor in the middle of it all. And uh, it was just so much fun. Uh, drumming, unfortunately, it's not something you can practically do. You've got, you've got neighbors around you who are going to complain. Um, it's a big instrument. You can't find space for it. It's quite expensive as well if you want a decent kit. Uh, so then I moved over to keyboard. I moved over to MIDI composition back in the mid-90s. And that's kind of where the whole digital thing started, yeah. Nice, nice. How did you end up creating your own YouTube channel and making your videos? Well, some folks might wonder why my YouTube channel name is Fagatron. Um, I was actually driven by a client once in America on the way to a meeting who happened to be gay. And uh, I know what certain words mean in American culture. And so this guy turned around and said, so, you know, why, why is your name Fagatron? And I just thought, oh, God, I just, I, just, I just lost the job. This has to be the end. And so I had to explain to the guy uh, I created my channel when I was like 16, 15. It was nothing more than a vlog channel. I just wanted to do something stupid, make my friends laugh. And then unfortunately, that's the channel I uploaded Alice to. 
And of course, you can't really move videos from a channel to another. Once it's there, it's there. Once it's created that unique URL, you're done. Um, I've spoken to Google, I've spoken to YouTube about getting it changed, and there's just nothing that can be done, unfortunately. But uh, yeah, it just started out as a vlog channel, and unfortunately, uh, <laughs> the thing about YouTube is you, you don't make plans. You don't wake up one morning and say, I'm going to make a viral video. It never that, happens that, that oh way. Oh, yeah. It's all no. happenstance and comes out of nowhere. That's right, which is kind of one of the difficulties in doing it for a living. You know, clients come to you saying, I want you to have a video for my product or my movie that gets so many million hits. And you think, well, it's, you know, YouTube is a, a cruise ship without a captain. You know, you oh, don't yeah. know where it's going to go. So it's, it can be challenging like that, yeah. So the most important thing, I think, as a YouTube creator is to do things that you love to do and that you feel is right. Exactly, exactly. So where does the name Pogo come from? I used to draw comic strips in school. Uh, I never did my schoolwork. I couldn't be buggered. I knew that I wasn't going to be a mathematician. I could just, you know, you get to the age of 10, you can figure out what your brain is and isn't wired to do. I think every kid more or less knows that. You know, you get to 10, you can look at yourself in maths class and think, damn, I'm really not doing well here. Or English, you know, I'm doing really, really well. Uh, in maths, I couldn't stand it. So I just drew comic strips. I knew I wasn't going to get any better at it. I wasn't interested in it. I wanted to draw. I wanted to make art. And so I drew this one comic strip called Pogos, which was this take on Pokemon slash Digimon, etc. Um, I don't know. And then a few years later, I started making music on the internet. We had this website called Acid Planet from Sony, which is kind of like a Spotify, but for up and comers. Okay. And so I threw my stuff up on there and I called myself Pogo. Uh, got a whole bunch of plays that way. And yeah, just, it's just kind of stuck. I wish I could say it's got this deep meaning behind it, but it doesn't, I'm not that intelligent. Funny, 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 funny you mentioned that because uh, there is a comic strip called Pogo. <laughs> There, yeah, that is true, actually, which I didn't find out until <laughs> years later. <laughs> yeah, if you type Pogo into Google Image Search, he comes up more than anything. It, it is. It is just like I mentioned my friends about you, and it's like, Pogo, is that the comic strip? And I'm like, you guys, it's Pogo the musician on YouTube. He's great, <laughs> not just a comic strip, you know? Jeez. So <laughs> just thought that was hilarious. So, God, okay. So how did you... When you did Alice for the first time, what was that experience creating Alice and now making that a style of videos, mi remixing music and movies, all that stuff? Well, like I said, it's not something I planned. It's not something you exactly. can plan. Exactly. So it was a huge, ex it was just a massive rush to find that I had communicated with so many people at once because music is a tremendous form of communication. Um, I think it's the one universal language that's free of politics, free of divisiveness, free of polarization. It brings people together in a way that nothing else does, and I think that's just great. So to know that I'd communicate, because I was looking at these view, these these numbers, and I thought, why the hell is this getting so many hits? So I went onto Google, I typed in you know Pogo Space Alice. I was just curious, and it was everywhere. It was on all the websites. It was on all the video hosting websites, and uh, that was just that knocked me back. It kind of made me think to myself, geez, maybe there's something to this. Maybe I don't have to be working in an office doing graphic design anymore. And fortunately enough, the company went under during the recession. So I started doing this more full time. And then I started getting clients, commissions. I did some stuff for Pixar as my first job. I got to fly out to the campus there, shake hands with John Lasseter. That was great fun. And uh, it's just skyrocketed. It's It's been amazing. God, that's so awesome. Uh, so what was... Okay, what was the coolest experience working for a client you ever experienced besides Pixar? Pixar's probably up there, right? Oh, Pixar's, oh, that's, yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's at the top of the pyramid, easy. Shaking hands with, you know, Mr. Toy Story, Mr. Bugs Life, come on. Oh, it's just crazy. Um, I remember he said to me, uh, love what you do, please do it with our movies, so... Uh, and that's all, that's all he really said, because the guy just, he's got no time to do or say anything. He's just rushed off his feet 24-7, as you can imagine. Uh, but, uh, you know, then I got to do more live-action stuff. I, I got to work with Good Makers Films, so they flew me out to Kenya for three weeks, and I just spent time filming all of these beautiful kids just singing and dancing and making all sorts of sounds. And the goal was to come back and turn all the footage into music. Um, 
Same thing with Bhutan. You know, we funded the trip on Kickstarter. Um, went and spent a few weeks there filming like stuff, you know, with Bhutanese culture, Tibetan culture. Uh, yeah, just the world remix stuff has just been amazing. The real life remix stuff because it means I can get into filmmaking and photography as well. Um, yeah, it's it's just I, I, creativity is what I'm on this planet to do, hands down. And you're very, you are very creative. You are a very creative dude. Your oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> your, your stuff just is just mind blowing. The things you come up with. Um, so, are you self taught when it comes to producing music and videos, or did you go to uni or anything like that to learn all that stuff? I did go to a film school, and it's purely by happenstance that my first employer found me there. It's not like I hadn't even finished get my course, my course, so I didn't have a diploma. Um, they were just hunting there for, for, for people to come work for them. Um, I don't advocate the idea that you need to go to an educational institution to get into the arts. I think that's rubbish. Uh, a diploma doesn't change the fact that you can or can't make awesome artwork. You know, Artwork is something that comes from inside of you. It's something that it's a craft that you hone through a process of self-direction and passion. Uh, you know, you can't teach passion to somebody, right? The whole idea of an arts degree to me is preposterous. But um, you want to talk about medicine, you want to talk about engineering, all right, that's a different conversation, I guess. Um, so I went and did film school for a couple of years. I studied 3D animation for a year. That was good fun. Uh, I've just always been self-directed, self-taught, yep. Started off with a PlayStation game called Music. I just wanted to figure out how to make my own tracks. Uh, spend all of my school holidays on a beanbag in front of the TV making tracks on this PlayStation game. Uh, then I found software programs on the computer. And yeah, look, if you don't love what you do, you're not going to get better at it. That's the thing. Exactly. Exactly. What particular software do you use to produce? I, okay, so I started off with uh, FL Studio, uh, which is kind of my main DAW. Uh, for audio editing and stuff, I used Cool Edit Pro, which now is known as Audition. It's owned by Adobe. I uh, still use that. Most amazing audio editor I've ever laid my hands on. Uh, although I am looking at Pro Tools now. Pro Tools is starting to get very interesting, the stuff they're coming out with at the moment. Um, and then uh, Ableton as well. I tend to use Ableton more for client work because it sort of feels a bit more organized, whereas... Uh, in FL Studio, I can really sketch ideas out quickly, but it's all a bit mishmash. It's all a bit scatterbrained, you know. Ableton is kind of more structured and it's a bit more organized. I like the way I can piece a structure together on a timeline and it's all just cohesive. For FL Studio, you know, you've got this god-awful list that just gets longer and longer, which you have to hunt through, um, all sorts of things. Uh, I haven't looked at Reason much. Uh, that's about it, really. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. That's cool for all those audio heads out there that and yeah, software geeks out there. That's a very there. technical question. <laughs> because you know, a lot of people will probably ask that, like, "What software do you use? I want. I would like to learn how to do this myself." Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. that's definitely it's something. Oh, just, the secret's just you know, download a couple of demo versions and just, just go nuts. Just try yeah, it out. That's true. Your fans are massive Disney fans. I, I know the fan base. Like I've seen like every video, and they're like when you do something different, they really go off kilter on your <laughs> on your work. Especially when you did the Pulp Fiction video. Uh huh. That's one of my favorite videos that and remixes you ever done. To be honest, because I am a huge fan of Pulp Fiction. That's a great movie, and the things you did with it was just astounding. So thanks. So outs yeah. so when it comes to movies, how do you select those? I know some are client based, but when you're doing movies and what besides Disney, how do you select it? Do you just feel like grabbing a movie and playing with it or you just you know? Uh yeah, it's just whatever sounds good. I gravitated towards the Disney stuff because the way orchestras were recorded back in those days just sounds gorgeous nowadays everything's quite sterile if you listen to the first alice of wonderland you listen to pinocchio it just sounds amazing it's just got that vintage character that i think everyone loves it's why people love the music in fallout you know fallout 3 fallout 4 the video games 
uh, people just love that sound. It's just that vintage vinyl sort of old tube amplifier sound. Uh, just great. Uh, I don't call myself a Disney artist, though, or a Disney remixer. It just happens that that's how I started. If you go right. through my SoundCloud, you'll see I'm anything but a Disney remixer. It's actually a, a lot of everything, really. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that uh, fortunately for me, I happen to choose a market that is already big and is already lively. Oh, yeah. You know, Disney. If, if you want to get big on YouTube, well, it's not a bad idea to use Disney content. Exactly. Um, it's okay. That makes a lot of sense. Um, God, there's like so many stuff you've done. You've there's like the Back to the Future mix you've did. I mean, Back to the Future is my favorite movie, by the way. So when you did Back to the Future, oh, okay. that was just it blew my mind. I was like, oh, you did Back to the Future? Fuck yeah! <laughs> yeah, I need to redo that track. It's so slow. It's so sleepy. It, it does. It is. It needs. It needs to be a reworked. I. I, I will agree with that. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. yeah. I think. Uh, Back to the Future is. Uh, you know, it's it's an energetic movie. You, you, once a beat in there. A lot of the stuff I did in the old days like that was very slow, very sleepy. It's one of the things I really hate about my first work. Yeah, I think, I mean, you could always go back, redo them, or even do, like, another remix of the movie. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. Like, when I do, uh, when I play live, I have to remix my tracks. Like, uh, Time Machine is definitely in there. I've actually gone and doubled the BPM. Uh -huh. uh, and so now it's like a dance beat. So, um, yeah, if, if I play Time Machine as it is now on YouTube at a club, nobody will be able to move to it. It's just too slow. True. So you do live. How does that work? Well, the idea is just to take all the layers from all of my tracks and piece them together into new kind of twisted experiments in front of people. And the video follows along with all of that. It's all synchronized. Uh, I've got a big pad a big uh, grid of pads in front of me which each, each has a different sound on it and then I just go nuts I just have fun and um, everyone has a really really good time oh, damn what video did you have the most fun with oh jeez uh, I think the Robert Tilton track comes to mind because it took me two days to make um, both track and video the guys just such a riot i am without saying anything about the man's reputation or profession um he's just funny he's just really gen i just find him so hysterically entertaining and he just made this whole track on his own i didn't i barely had to touch it it just slung itself together and it's just yeah i just remember just laughing in the studio for two whole days it was just so much fun oh man that's good um are there any movies or even TV shows you want to remix? Um, yeah, I'm actually, I've kind of got my sights set on the Home Alone films at the moment because uh. we are approaching November soon and then December. So it's Christmas time. It's time to break out the, um, it's time to, time to break out Home Alone again. So I, I think it's time to uh, maybe finally get around to mixing it. Ah. Uh. Yeah, uh, TV series. Hmm. Stranger Things is definitely interesting me at the moment. Yeah, I was it's... I was I was thinking that because season two is coming around the corner here this That's week. That's right. So yeah, not a bad time to jump on that it, wagon. Oh, yeah. it's that's not a bad time to jump on anything. Stranger Things. That is a hot ticket. You might get views on that, baby. <laughs> I can that's tell. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Although the last time I made something for the purpose of getting hits, I made something called, I think it was, uh, My Angel or Vision or something like that. Uh, and it was an experiment I had with my manager at the time to find this kid with a good voice and try and recreate the Justin Bieber phenomenon. Uh, and so we got this poor, yeah, we got this kid, John Shan, uh, into his um, place in the Philippines because I was living there at the time. And we recorded him singing, and we wanted to make it raw. We wanted to make it as believable as we could. And it still just comes off, you know, terribly staged and contrived. And it's uh, sitting currently on just under 190,000 hits, and it was uploaded to 2013. So that really bombed. 
vision bombed as well. And it, it just went to prove to me that you you can't formulate these things. You, no. know, you, you have to, it has to come from a, a real place inside you. Yeah. How do you produce a track from a movie? How does that process go? Well, it's all about finding sounds that you can use. That's one of the things I love about it. <clears throat> uh, it's about creating music with very unconventional material. So instead of using real drums, you'll go into Alice in Wonderland or something and you'll find a flower beating on another flower to produce this awesome sound. And then you use that as a certain kind of drum and then you find this note in this person's voice. Of course, back in those days, you didn't have auto-tune, you didn't have Melodyne. So it was much more of a thing to hear a movie character singing in a track when the character isn't actually singing. Nowadays, when you hear that, it's just you, you immediately assume it's been auto-tuned, it's been Melodyne. So it's far less of a novelty than it was. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, you go through the film and you look for the sounds that you want. Uh, I make a pool of things that I like, and then I'll basically just start throwing them around uh, I'll, I'll pull them this way push them that way and it's just a case of feeling it out and I find the less you think and the more you feel the better it turns out okay okay so let's get into talking about faves good stuff bad stuff what is your favorite movie ah oh, geez Blazing Saddles is up there for me uh what else have we got here? Uh, I'll no, <laughs> I won't get into that one. Uh, a woman under the influence, nineteen seventy four, is very very good. I thought that was excellent. Uh, let's see, Cube, nineteen ninety seven, that was pretty good. Uh, I'm watching Get Out at the moment, which is uh, twenty seventeen. I haven't seen that uh, yet, but so far it's really good. Okay. Yeah, okay. some like it hot from. Oh, geez, 1960 something. Uh, I'm a big Spaceballs fan. Anything Mel Brooks, really. Yeah, Mel Brooks uh, is great. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the Apartment, 1960, with Jack Lemmon, I loved. The Aviator was fantastic. Um, yeah. Oh, and of course, uh, American Tale, Five All Goes West. Oh, that's so yeah, good. Yeah, was so In good. Fact, that's on my hit list at the moment. Yeah, I have to do something with this. You you have to do something with Don Bluth at least. Come on. Yes. Do do a Don Bluth animated movie. That that would be, oh, just oh, I can imagine it. Oh. Yeah, I want to make another Trump mix as well. I have to do it. <laughs> I could do a whole EP with that guy. <laughs> One is not enough. I mean, he's full of everything, so he's perfect to just to make anything oh, out yeah. of, so... Yeah. <laughs> he's amazing. <laughs> Quote, amazing. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So, I, there's a lot of classics in there, I've, I've noticed. Like, you're into more, like, classic kind of movies, you know, some... I mean, some recent stuff here and there. Um, yeah. What is, I know it's kind of different from fair, but what is the best movie you have, like, ever seen, you know? It might not be the perfect movie, but it's the best when it comes to acting, directing, cinematography, lighting, and all that stuff. What is the best? The technical stuff. All the tech, yeah, all of that. What is yeah, the best? Children of Men comes to mind. All right. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Alfonso Cuaron directed that, and he also did uh, A Little Princess, oh. which is the Whisper Loot track on my channel. Uh, he also did Gravity, obviously, with oh, uh, Sandra Bullock oh, yeah. and George Clooney, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, Gravity was very impressive, but I, I only cared for the first quarter when she's spiraling off into space and there's that ultra-wide shot of her against the stars and you're thinking, damn, she's screwed. Uh, that's how the film should have kept going, if you ask me. She should have kept... Because she's traversing into the unknown and that's what's intriguing to the human mind but when she gets tethered back by the George Clooney fella it's like oh okay well that was getting interesting for a little while <sighs> uh, I don't know I feel like it missed a bit of it should have gone into a, a black hole or something or you know a warp <laughs> a, a warp tunnel or something cool or you know what happens if she just kept it on kept on drifting don't you want to see what happens to that 
Well, I'm, just, I'm totally derailing here. I'm sorry. True. That's fine. That's that's what I love about talking about movies. You get into details and going deep into the movies and yeah. what you, you know, it might be nitpicking, might be more like what you think of it. I, I love this stuff. I love going into that stuff. Like, I've, like I said, I've, I'm a huge 80s fan. Besides the music, I love the movies from the 80s. Like, I've loved, like I said, my favorite movies, Back to the Future, for example. That's a, uh-huh. Per- that's a perfect movie for me. It has every detail. Yeah, the script is just phenomenally it, good. Yeah. It is. The script is good. The detail in it, like there's like hidden things you have to look at. Like for, yep. for a time travel movie, like I thought it was amazing. Like because Marty runs over a pine towards the beginning because those twin pines, and now you look, you know, he goes back to the present. It's Lone Pine Mall, which is the perfect detail you never notice until you watch no, it in yeah. repeat views. So right. those little it's details very are very clever. You know, no movie yep. has those foreshadowing kind of clues and details. I love it that way. No other movie has done that for me besides Back to the Future. Um, yeah, it's genius. Actually, uh, I read a, a book about script writing once, and they the one movie they referenced all the time for examples of good script writing was Back to the Future. That that's good. That's fucking all great. All the time. Yeah. That's good. And you realize, like, wow, this is actually a really good script. This is just amazingly well written, like freakishly well written. They yeah. don't do it like that anymore. No, no. It's, when it comes to scripts, nothing's better than Back to the Future. I mean, no. Originally, funny enough, originally the the time machine was supposed to be a fridge, a, f- a refrigerator. Like people, they wanted to make a time. Oh yeah. And they're like, oh no, no, I can't do that. Kids will hop inside and want to go back in time. So they just changed it to a car, the iconic DeLorean, which... Jeez, what uh, a good decision, though. The fridge is a lot less exciting. <laughs> it's just like, let's... Well, it was that plus, like, it has to be like a nuclear hol- like a nuclear explosion to make it go back in time. So that kind yeah. of didn't kind of match up. So it was just like, kind of reminds me of the uh, movie you cannot talk about when it comes to Indiana Jones, <laughs> nuking, uh-huh. nuking the fridge. That, oh, yeah. Uh, but it's, it's like 80s, fucking 80s. I love it so much. Yeah, the the Breakfast Club comes to mind too. Oh, John Hughes, John Hughes uh, is just a great director. He's the man when it comes to Brad Pack movies. The the Breakfast Club. My God, that yeah, is. Yeah, I mean, who'd have who'd have thought that a movie that takes place entirely in a library would be interesting, right? It, it is. It was. The script, once again, script is great. The dialogue, the characters, that's what makes a movie. Like some, It doesn't have to be this romp of a action or sci-fi or adventure. It can be a simple movie where you're talking and it's all about dialogue. That's, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's, more CG doesn't make a bad script good. No, no. I mean, the effects are supposed to support the movie and... You know, yeah. you don't always need that, and CGI just, it can work in some ways, but not always, and sometimes you can go practical. Practical effects are just the most amazing thing um, to use. I think that's why the first Star Wars movies were so entrancing, because your eyes were telling you that it's real. You could see that the Death Star was a thing looming in front of the lens, you know, you could see that Yoda was there in space with Mark Hamill. No, oh. CG still isn't there yet. We look at it and we still see PlayStation graphics, Xbox graphics, but it's yeah. in a movie. Is yeah. that bang for my buck? Is it? <laughs> you know, it's just it yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's kind of the same thing with. Um, I know George Lucas is the guilty ple- guilty of a guy who's going back to his movies special editions. Let's put CGI in there. Yeah. It reminds yeah. me of um, another director who worked on a movie of his for repeatedly different versions of Blade Runner by Ridley Scott. He took that movie and kind of made it because he didn't have c- complete control with the theatrical cut. So the director's cut, he kind of had some wee- leeway with it. And the final cut is the perfect version of Blade Runner. And now this year, uh-huh. and this year alone, they did a sequel, Blade Runner 2049, which is phenomenal. Um, okay, I've not seen. Uh, what is it? Blade Runner? Is it like twenty forty eight or something? Twenty forty nine. Twenty nine. I'm off one digit. Okay, so yeah, enough. and that's good, is it? Yeah, it is. It's Blade Runner is a, definitely a movie that you should check out. The original movie from eighty two. Um, Absolutely. The, fi- the final 
cut from 2007, which is 10 years ago, is a great example of a sci-fi noir. And the visuals alone is just phenomenal. Harrison Ford is amazing. It's practical. There's, I know the final cut has some green screen and special effects, but it's, you can't, you barely notice it because it's very mixed in. So, uh huh. Um, that is. Well, a... they used a lot of rear projection in those days too. Oh yeah. Uh, in models Terminator too. Judgment Day. Just there's not really any green screen there. It's all rear projection. Oh yeah. And it just looks awesome. It looks stunning. <sighs> yeah. That's yeah. another movie that's on my list, actually. I, I hate to say it, Terminator 2 is one of my favorite movies. Yeah, oh, yeah. people love Terminator uh, T2. It is so good. It is yeah. so good. You oh, you did you did a remix oh, of... Oh, yeah, um, I did, actually. That's right, yeah. You did. It was Yeah, that was a while ago, too. But that's but it doesn't hurt to do another one. You can always do different takes on it. You can always... I'd rather... Yeah, I'd much rather... I'm not a big fan of this whole... See, a big challenge you get with a lot of clients is they say, we want you to mix up all the characters, all the people. We want to see everything in there because we have to give the movie studio as much bang for their buck. But that's not what makes a good song. You know, what makes... Like, look at Alice, for God's sake. What makes a good song is simplicity, is minimalism, if anything. Focus, you know. And um, in the instance of... Skynet Symphonic, I wanted to tell the story of the film. I wanted to see if I could do that, and it was a great experiment, but nothing about it stands out in your head when you think about the track, because it's all, it's like five separate things, five separate sections, you know, you know three or four different characters all going off at one side. Right. You, don't, you don't know where to hang your hat. It's just too much. Yeah, I can see what you mean. I've, mm. I have a majority of your... Uh videos in my favorites so that is one of them in there and i tend to listen to that sometimes when i'm just doing whatever so it just okay. pops in and i just hear that it's really good sometimes um yeah there's so many so many opportunities and so many things it's just like i know there's other uh youtuber musicians that are doing that sort of similar thing but not with movies but like with random everyday objects i know mm -hmm. there's couple out there they do that so it's not just a niche thing so it's a it's a popular thing to do because you know music yeah. is a transformative that's you know, right it's very transformative you get to turn anything into music so yeah but with you with movies and sometimes tv shows it is just unique how you particularly go through your mind and just say what sounds good what goes with what it is just yeah uh, that's something I can't really that there's not a science to it you can't give it a formula no you can't it is just it, no. you, it comes just straight out of you okay it so. does yeah and painters will tell you the same thing illustrators uh, yeah it, it's kind of the, the cosmos coming through you in a weird way uh, I know yeah I, I, I couldn't give it a formula if, if, if you paid me no it, it's just it's natural it's pure natural for you, and it, I just love the way you do that. Um, Thank you. What? Okay, so we talked about good stuff. Let's just let's just scrape the bottom of the barrel. What is the worst of the worst movies you have ever seen? Just like pure crap. <laughs> oh boy. Jeez, you know, see, the, those don't stand out in my mind as much as the things that I love. Really? Uh, no, which is, yeah, really interesting. I didn't like the new Pirates of the Caribbean at all. Well, that's I, that's a given. I think I mean, that goes without saying. It's it's just a, a cash cow at this stage. That's that's what sequels are. I mean, sequels are definitely cash cows, you know? Well, what did you think of The Mummy Returns with Brendan Fraser? That... You know, I have it on DVD, and I also have Mummy Returns DVD. That is a great set of movies. I haven't seen that's a third one yet, but Brendan, that's that's an adventure film. That is a great, you know... Set. Yeah, he it's did a, it well. He did, yeah. It, Brendan Fraser is a really underappreciated actor, and he did a really good job with The Mummy. Yeah, and I think Steve Sommers directed it. In fact, it's I think it's maybe the only movie of his that I actually think is really good. I, I do uh, But agree. that's a sequel that's pretty... Yeah, Re Returns is, is alright. Um, but we're trying to think of movies that, it's, that are really just terrible. Uh, boy. I mean, yeah. 
I mean, they did did recently reboot the Mummy with Tom Cruise this year. So that's right, which I will never see. I never seen the other, so I'm staying the fuck away from it. Yeah, uh, no, it's just all going to shit at the moment, isn't it? I mean, there's some hidden gems in movies, but there's just crap beyond crap coming out. It's like, I mean, yeah. I've they'll remake E. T. eventually. They'll remake. Jaws. Uh, re- well, they have remade Jaws, haven't they? I'm pretty sure. Well, um, well, every shark movie out there is basically Jaws, so it's not like a yeah. cut and paste of Jaws, but it's just like every shark movie they made, it's like, ooh, a shark's coming at ya. Yeah, well, okay. I mean, Interstellar is a movie I didn't really enjoy. I didn't think that, it was That's that what great. I kind of thought, because you mentioned Gravity, and in my head I was like, what about Interstellar by Christopher Nolan? Like, that has, like, black holes and all that shit going for and yeah okay so the, the, the reason i didn't like it is because it answers too many questions and when you're dealing with things to do with space time fourth dimensions you don't have a license to tell people this and tell people that like love is the fourth dimension is it really is it um then you get to the end of that movie, and, and it's just like you got the robot coming over the intercom telling you, giving everything to you on a silver platter. It's like, dude, we're talking about the fourth dimension here. Let my imagination have some space. That's why I didn't like it. Now, you watch 2001 Space Odyssey, that's the opposite end of that spectrum. That's all oh, yeah. space, time. But it's almost too far the other direction. You don't know what's going on. Uh, but it is incredibly mysterious, I thought, and intriguing. And you walk away from that movie thinking, geez, what is out there? What is the other dimension? You know, I have to know. I have to know. Whereas Interstellar says, well, this is what all that is. You don't, you don't have to keep wondering. Exactly. Um, who do you like when it comes to directors? Who's your fave? Who, who do you look for when it comes to directors? I know there's some new ones coming out, new directors, and there's some definitely some classic directors you can always get inspiration from. Who do you like? Um, who's the guy that did... Um, it's that movie where there's like a political... Like, there's like a social class system on a train. And it's off in the future, so the one carriage is like the low class, the next oh, carriage is the low oh, class. Oh, you're, what talking is about, that? you're talking about Snowpiercer. Yeah, who's the guy? I who did don't, that? I don't, I can't pronounce his name, but he's. I know who the director is. I know who you're talking about. I, I, I don't want to butcher his name on this because it is a. He's from, oh, crap. Who? I think it says here his name is Bong Joon Ho. Yes, Bong, yes, or, Bong yeah. Joon Ho. There we go. Yeah, I've seen some of his stuff, which I'm really impressed with. Uh, Okja was good. I thought Okja was great. Oh, yeah. Um, it's got an agenda behind it, you know, but it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't shove it down your throat. Right. I, I thought Okja was great. Actually, I was very privileged to see Okja in 4K HDR uh, with Dolby Vision, which was just Ooh, fantastic. Lucky. Uh, yeah. But, um, what else have we got? Yeah, Alfonso Cuaron stuff. I mean, he did one of the Harry Potter movies. I think he did uh, Prisoner of Azkaban. Yes. He seems to like shooting everything in a wide shot, like one big take. One shot, yeah. Like uh, if you think back to Gravity, it's all just big. It's all just lots of one take shots. You know, just lots of wide angle stuff, and I really enjoy that. So I find that very immersive. I hate the whole cut, cut, cut approach where you yeah. can tell it's just been pieced together bit by bit. It, the whole thing's made in the edit room. You know, instead of on the sh- on on the set which i don't like i agree like editing i can appreciate the editing and edits but i really would like to see more stuff that's like made into like a one shot if you can like choreograph it somehow where you can have it in one shot you can move the camera around have it one shot don't cut just have it one take and it's just i would love to see more of that like absolutely i i think there's a time and a place for a close-up you know, it's not something you should pull out every every few seconds. You know, I think a close up is to me. It's something that you, the the movie has to earn because a close up is very intimate. Uh-huh. Uh, but if I do, if, if if you haven't developed that character, if I don't know that character, then a close up feels awkward. A close up feels forced. 
So to me, I think wide shots and establishing shots. And if you watch ET, you know, if you watch The Shining, if you watch a lot of that stuff, like Kubrick was massively into this as well. He did lots of wide shots with lots of steady cam stuff, and you'd only ever get into close-ups when you've come to know the characters and when you actually really need to know what's going through their mind. Nowadays, everything's a talking headshot. Everything's a close-up, and I hate it. Ugh. Yeah, I, I can understand that very well. <laughs> I will be a bit opinionated from time to time. <laughs> that, hey, hey, that's fun. I, I can probably agree to most things. I mean... Some things work, some things don't, and um, yeah, I mean, what's, what what's your take on music and movies? Do you think like because they don't like uh, what are you referring to? Okay, well, if you watch something like Liar Liar, I think it's a Tom Shadyak movie with Jim Carrey. <laughs> uh, that that's a great example of a movie that I think is butchered by music. Uh, it's just constantly telling you how to feel. Ah, uh, okay, okay, okay. You're talking about how the like the soundtrack would yeah, take take I over. Clarify. The soundtrack yeah. would take over the movie, or you know, music kind of dictates where the movie goes. Right, overscoring. Absolutely. O overscoring. Yes. Okay, I yeah. see what you mean now. Because, um, you know, sometimes I don't like recognize that a lot i don't pay attention to how the music overscores or underscores anything like uh -huh. um depending on the movie like sometimes a soundtrack will emphasize the movie will make the thing grander um <laughs> yes well it's a it's very common with i guess big action films but um it's not it's actually not as common as it used to be i was watching contact not long ago with jody foster uh, that's also robert zemeckis movie. yeah robert zemeckis yeah Yep, yep, Zemeckis. yep. I never know how to pronounce his name. Zemeckis, Zemeckis. Zemeckis. But uh, a lot of... I thought it was a really good movie. Unfortunately, it doesn't really get interesting until three quarters of the way through, oh, for me anyway. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a shame. But it's just really, really well done, except the music is very heavy-handed. And I think that was very common in the 90s, was we're not quite sure if people are going to get this scene, so let's just lather some music onto it. You know, I don't like that. I think a story should tell itself. That's true. I mean, I can understand where you're coming from. There are, that's kind of like a trope in a way where the soundtrack would kind of dictate you because there's like, there's happy music, sad music, you know, music that drives the force of it and you would like understand it more. But sometimes, you know, uh, audience, general audiences, like mind you, there are different sections of people. There's general audiences that'll go to see a movie and they'll just have a turn their brains off and enjoy the movie for what it is. And there's just cinephiles or aficionados like us that are just like tune in to certain details of a movie with soundtrack or editing or whatever or cinematography. We get into that. That's why uh, the new movie Blade Runner 2049 didn't do so well at the box office because not a lot of people were interested in going to see it because it's such a long movie, mind you, and uh -huh. it's it's slower paced, but it's it has a nice build up because it's a mystery movie in the process. Uh -huh. a lot, so general audiences want something that's a little bit quicker because their attention spans are short. They want something quicker and moves a little faster when it comes it's to the movies. It's the Instagram era. It is. Yep. It's this. It's. <laughs> I mean, I'm in this. I'm in this generation, but it's like millennials are not like the audiences. You know, movies just it has to be quick and fast. Boom, boom, boom. You know, eat, there's this. It used to be that a goldfish, uh, goldfish's attention to, to detail or span of the de uh, this uh, was so slow because are so fast because it just doesn't remember things. Now we are just below that because our minds are going to shit because we just want things to be boom, boom, boom instead of just let, yeah. thing, let things go out and let it go. Um, well, I've, I, I've, 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 uh, I might be wrong, but I'm, I, I've heard that more of a movie's budget goes towards marketing it than actually making oh, it. Oh, that's... And, uh, <laughs> That is yeah. so true. Like, the marketing. And it's because I, I think it's just because it has to compete with viral video. It has to be on there with YouTube. You know, this is the on-demand era. 
Uh, uh, if it's yeah. not entertaining me within 20 seconds, I'm going to go watch something else. That's true. And sometimes, you know, uh, trailers, yeah, marketing, just, you know, you got to make sure you sell that movie. Gotta That's sell, right. Got to sell that movie like somehow. Days, like, remember Close Encounters of Third Kind? <sighs> oh, yeah. That's a slow movie, man. It is. And it's one of Spielberg's best movies, to be honest. Like, it's yeah. it's up there. It's It just turned 40 this year, and it's a great movie. Yeah. Uh, it's something I've noticed with a lot of his movies. He moves... He really takes his time with things. Like, uh, some folks might say that Spielberg's movies drag out, even if you watch the BFG. Every yeah. scene is like, oh, jeez, we've been here now for five minutes. You know, when are we gonna? When are we gonna get moving? Uh, what was that movie with that kid? Actually, it was one of Christian Bale's first movies. Um, Empire of the Sun, I believe. Yes, that's the one. Yes. And again, and then you watch Hook as well. Yep. And you watch E.T. Uh, and it's all, it's all, it all moves along at that same pace where he's really taking his time to build up these characters in that scene and I think in Hook it worked wonderfully but um, he kind of leaves a lot of his main points towards the end of the film you know like his turning points almost aren't to turning points they're kind of just little events whereas uh, something like Gravity you know you've got a colossal turning point within the first <laughs> uh, geez 20 minutes uh Every director's got a different way of, of pacing a movie. Yep, exactly. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Each director is going to be different, and yeah, uh, one of my pet peeves in when it comes to movies is that some people can't understand the difference between a director and a producer. Oh, okay. So one of the okay one of the big cases for this is um, Michael Bay. Michael Bay would produce something, and but it's directed by some other guy, and you see his quirks and little things he does with his directing stuff, but it's when you look at how he's producing stuff, you might see some of his detail into there, even though some other guy is directing it. But a lot yes. of... So... Um, the director has complete control of what he wants to do with the movie, but the producer might, you know, say, "Hey, I want this or I want that." You know, they're they're, right. they're making the movie go forward in a way, but sometimes the right producer won't do a lot. They'll just be there, you know, to provide whatever or just keep the thing going. But Michael Bay, however, especially when he produced the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movies, the live action ones, uh, they're directed by different people, but you see his fingerprints all over because you see the little things he's done in his previous movies like little things like like explosions and women scantily clad women and it's just interesting there was a movie i grew up on called we're back a dinosaur story uh-huh 1993 and for the longest time i thought that was a spielberg movie because I saw Spielberg all over it. And as a kid, you don't know what that means. You just figure, oh, yeah, it's a Spielberg movie. And if you watch Hook, you watch AI, Minority Report, and then you watch We're Back, or you watch Five Will Goes West, which is also a Spielberg movie in right. a sense. Right. Um, it has the same... You, you would almost think it's the same director because he's got all these long, really long takes where the camera just moves beautifully through the scene and there's a poetry to the way that the scene unfolds and everything is so beautifully paced and it's not just cut 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 it's all in one beautiful flowing take minority report is full of that mm -hmm. uh you could actually you, you might even say that spielberg took a lot of that from janus kaminski who was his cinematographer for a really really long time right uh you might because if you watch jaws before he paired up with janus he, he that style isn't there jaws is to, is a totally different piece of work to uh hook or minority report or ai but if you look at these movies we're back is it's not directed by spielberg and neither is bible goes west it's produced mm -hmm. by spielberg and it's directed by these two other guys but like you were saying it's got spielberg's 
fingerprint all over it. Yeah. And that's really interesting, isn't it? I, I would have thought a producer is just the guy that sits back and finds the money and finds the... Yeah, it, that, that is, that is. That's part of it. But from what I'm understanding of a producer, I might be wrong... I could be wrong, but the way I interpret a producer is that they'll finance it, you know, trying to get the thing going, get this and that, just to make sure it's being produced right. But, like, Michael Bay, for example, just really, it was like, wait, the director is not doing that on purpose. He's, that's not his style. Like, you see the director's style through a different director. Like, it's weird how the producer kind of, like, it's like a puppet hand kind of way, like, it's, right. it's gonna look like this in a way i don't know it, it kind of same with the script too and they might change something's in the script you know it's i i could be wrong with this but this is how i interpret it because i you, you see it with a lot of people like a lot of movies like there we might see like the whole spielberg thing it's like he produced it but it feels like it like even though it's not directed by him it is yeah and that's very strange but in some cases i don't think it is the case because with the Harry Potter films, I think the first two were Christopher Columbus. Uh -huh. He did uh, Home Alone 1 and 2, and you can tell. You can just tell. Especially because he's also paired up with John Williams. So right. it just, when you watch Home Alone, it is almost this. It's just, you can feel the same. It's the same artist behind the scenes. You know, you watch Harry Potter, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's just it's it's just warm, and it's fuzzy, and it's just beautiful. And oh, yeah. uh, But then you go to Prisoner of Azkaban, I'm not sure if it's the same producer, but now you're looking at the work of Alfonso Cuaron where he's zoomed out entirely. And now he's now you've got super wide shots and you've got, it's a totally different directorial style. Really interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, Chris Columbus did produce it, so. Oh, uh, interesting. And so, oh, he produced Prisoner, did he? Yeah, he produced Prisoner. He one, one, of, one of the producers. So, I mean, it depends on the movie, though. And, like, sometimes producers don't do a lot behind the scenes oh, yeah. besides helping it move forward. Some, I guess so, yeah. It, like, that's how I, like, that's how I look at things because sometimes you see the fingerprints of other directors. Well, yeah, because with some directors, they take influence from other directors into their own style you know that they borrow a lot you know that's how you yeah, get so your own style with ai yeah that's the yeah that's the case with that so that's yeah. that's how i'm thinking and interpreting what a producer is they you know and what directors do i mean so i just thought that was interesting you know people are like like <laughs> this is this is recent very recent so this recording is going to be really old when you listen to this in the future but now uh being announced if you're into Nickelodeon, uh, they announced a live-action Dora the Explorer movie. Uh, and I think Michael Bay is directing that, isn't it? Michael Bay is producing it. His company is producing it while they they hire the director, um, Nick Stoller, who directed Forgetting Sarah Marshall, Game to the Greek, um, yeah. Neighbors, Neighbors 2, and Storks. So it's... E. People are like, people are like, Michael Bay's producing, uh, directing, directing, and it's like, no, he's pretty. Well, I found out through Twitter. It was on Gamespot's Twitter. Yeah, you know, Gamespot, the guys yeah. that review games. Yeah. And the way they worded it was, uh, Michael Bay is making the door of the Explorer movie. Yeah, yeah, and that's how media does it. They take, yeah, they take things and they skew it into a way they want you to read it, and understand it, like. Yeah. You have to read between the lines sometimes. You gotta look deeper and look for the right sources. Like GameSpot, they're saying, they're saying Michael Bay is, but it's a production company that's doing Planum Dunes. He's producing it, yeah. but he's not exactly making it, directing it. You know. Yeah, it's kind of like Pirates of the Caribbean. Like, uh, you know, oh wow, Jerry Bruckheimer is making a Pirates movie. No, it's actually Gore Verbinski doing Pirates. It's the guy who did The Ring, and you know, right? They, they don't. They don't. It, it's not at the forefront of the whole marketing campaign. Mm -hmm, Very exactly. It's, mm. it's, it's, yeah, they often, you know, promote the producer more. It's like from the producers of blank and blank, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, it, we've they, all seen that. Sometimes they'll do the director from the director of blank and blank as well. They often do that. You know, some prolific directors will be promoted that way for their movies. You know, um, what are some examples of that? I see a lot. There's like, 
like for example Guillermo del Toro's new movie the Shape of Water coming out in two months on my birthday <laughs> so that's pretty cool um, uh. in the trailer it's like from the director of Pan's Labyrinth he directed Pan's yeah. Labyrinth that was a long time ago he's known for yeah. Hell. He, he was known for Hellboy Hellboy 2 and Blade 2 but they don't credit yeah. it. They don't credit that because Pan's Labyrinth is very high up when it comes to Guillermo del Toro's movies. So when people see that in the marketing, they're like, oh, this new movie could be just like that. They don't mention Crimson, Crimson Peak from a couple of years ago. They mentioned Pan, Pan's Labyrinth. So Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Well, they need they, they need to get as many people clicking that link as possible. So exactly. you know, what's the use of mentioning a movie no one's heard of? Yeah. Exactly. So you know marketing could be very different you know and the media how they take news and they skew it in the way they want to that's why movies for me is a very deep deep like passion of mine because it's interesting to see what it's being portrayed how the directors work i mean directors have different styles and they might take inspiration from other directors i you know we are trying to get our own style i mean you probably started out with a Diff, like taking inspiration from other people and then eventually yep. get into your own style so absolutely that's how we become yep. creative as people you know we try to work with what we got you know and then we'll find yeah. our style you mustn't bolt yourself down to this idea that you can be 100 percent original no you could no you can yeah, try to you be you mustn't able. ever feel ashamed for taking inspiration from somebody no. uh, i mean there's definitely i i do think you should you should follow your own heart and you should follow your own passion, but you must never feel ashamed of like something really inspires you and that's what gets you out of bed in the morning and you want to do something like that. That's fine. Yeah. Um, I mean, when I started out, I was listening to an artist called Akufin. Uh, this is back in 2000, oh, geez, 2000, 2001. Uh, and um, he made music using nothing but sounds that he recorded from the radio like uh, nothing but sounds so th it, it would just sound incredible it sounds like a demon's possessed your whole radio tuner it's just amazing and i wanted to do that and then i thought but no what if i did this with a movie like only one movie so that now you're actually listening to a film and so that's when alice kind of came into the whole mix uh, that's that's good i mean that's something's happens in life and it's for the better i mean couldn't imagine life being this way i mean you can think back it's like now it's now it's my career i get to do this for a living you know i get to that's right i get to you know do this for clients i could do this for my youtube channel and then of course i go on tour i do this live in front of people this is the greatest life yeah. i probably can never experience Absolutely. again yep yep um uh, yeah I, I think there's uh there's no surer way to lead a happy life, I think, than to do what you love to do. You'll create, you'll ultimately have the most opportunities in front of you by following what you really want to do, uh, not what you think is going to make lots of money, not what you think is going to get you a big house on you know, Sunset Boulevard, whatever. Um, it has to, and you will start small. You're guaranteed to start small, but that's if you're not focused on getting big, then that's not going to dishearten you. And eventually you'll you'll have done what you love to do so much that you'll be extremely good at it and you you will get attention you will get work through it actually that's a movie i really didn't like king kong you, you asked me a while back uh you're didn't like the you're king kong remake you're talking about peter jackson's king yes kong? of course oh uh, yeah i agree i agree like that is too much too much for it's me way too much it's yeah, like, it is. Do, do, do we want to see Kong in a skating rink with just skating on ice in New York? Did we want to see that? I don't think so. Yeah. And again, it's over the top with the whole scoring. It's just the score is there almost 90% of the damn movie, and I can't stand it because it's so corny. It's so cliche. I think a movie's pretentiousness comes a lot from its, uh, you could say, the cinematography just going overboard and the music and for me in king kong peter jackson's king kong it's just the cheesiest cheesiest thing i've seen in a long time um, yeah, yeah i can i mean Pete, see there are two 
It's funny because Peter Jackson is from New Zealand as well, so really close to. Say again, sorry. It's really funny because Peter Jackson is from New Zealand, so he's. Oh yes. He's he's uh close to Australia, so he's a bit of a, you know, different speed. Yeah, he's a bit of a neighbour. Yeah, I, I grew up in New Zealand actually for seven years. Um, same island that he directed a lot of Lord of the Rings on. The guy's made so much money that he's actually bought a whole street of houses for people to live in while right. they film in New Zealand. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm. I've told one Australian this already, but I'll tell you this. Uh, I have yet to see Lord of the Rings. Any of them? Any of them. Wow. I've n- never... <laughs> and you call yourself a film critic. Ex- exactly. Like, <laughs> it's like... Uh, oh, man, yeah. But Peter Jackson, like, that's a, a director that's worth talking about because, like I said, I have seen Lord of the Rings. I have not seen... Um, the Hobbit movies, which I don't think I'm missing out on much. Um, no, not, not. Uh, King. The obvious like mainstream ones I've seen is like King Kong, but that's it. Like I've seen his early work. His early work is holy. F- if you see, no good. Oh no no no! The opposite effect. This this is phenomenal. Like uh, if you watch his early movies, that is great director workmanship there he's doing stuff on a low budget you know um uh uh i'm trying to think of the titles because there's several titles i know meet the feebles as one of them because he uh it's like the muppets but it's very um explicit very like i see it's like the puppets are very like they show nudity and there's smoking and there's oh, vomiting. So it's it, for it, it's adult. gross. It's adults, yes, and it's it 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 was released on my birthday in New Zealand. It was one of my birthday movies, and I was like, mm. "Meet the Feebles." What the heck is this shit? I mean, it's it's great puppet work. It's it's a puppet movie. It's something you probably won't see <laughs> anytime soon. Bad Taste, which was 30 years ago, that is his first film, and he plays two roles in the movie. He acts and directs in that movie. So uh-huh. you, and he's doing double duties with that. He does great acting as two characters, and he's directing a low-budget movie with special effects. Like, he he made, like, masks. Uh, he baked it into his... He baked them in his mother's oven. You know? This is, like, practical effects that he made on his own with his own hands. Um, wow! Yeah, this is like before you got a budget because then after those two movies you got Brain Dead and that movie, <laughs> that one blew my mind. That uh, zombies and blood and oh oh my god, the ending is just blows your mind. I, I can't explain. If you want to see his early work, you have to go see that. I have yet to see Heavenly Creatures. The Frighteners is when he gets into more high budget more prolific actors frighteners is with michael j fox of course from back to the future of course and i think robert zemeckis also produced it so back oh yeah interesting so he uh had oh maybe not wait wait let me rewind my words for a bit robert zemeckis recommended peter jackson to direct um the frighteners which michael j fox had kind of word from that and Danny Elfman did the music for it and it's wow yeah that's a great movie to check out but Uh but after that just I've never Lovely Bones is another one I haven't seen yet from Peter Jackson if you check early work from directors is actually pretty interesting to check out because like I said Peter Jackson did everything by himself you know acting directing you know a lot of dubbing and you know it's interesting to see how they start off yeah, I, I, that is interesting. So you were saying Peter Jackson was kind of a one-man band in his early days. Yes, exactly. Uh, that's very interesting. It is. Yeah. So that's uh, definitely a self-directed kind of guy. It is, and that's yeah. He started out that way, and before he got the major bucks from studios, and that's where the budget comes in for the rest of the movies. Um, yeah. Well, he he pitched Lord of the Rings as one movie, and then oh yeah, 
New Line Cinema turned around and said, why don't you make three? Uh, and District 9 as well, I think, started out as a bunch of guys in South Africa with a short film, but uh, that it was really low-budget stuff. But then Peter Jackson saw it and found it, and he said, yeah, you know, here's $120 million. Here's, let, let's see a movie. Let's see a real blockbuster. You guys can do it. So um, that was awesome. And again, like we were saying earlier, that was Peter Jackson Presents District 9. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when I think it was actually Neil Blumkamp yeah. who directed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So let's get the names right, guys. Get, guys, just get the, the credit where it's credits due. Yeah, let's be uh, a little more accurate. Oh, man. So so what we got coming up from you is Home Alone remixes, for sure. Maybe. We'll Ma- see. Maybe. We'll see how things go. Yeah. Um, I don't like to materialize an idea before I've actually taken a stab it's, at it yet it's a, it's a sneak peek maybe you'll you'll see yeah, it maybe, maybe you won't <laughs> yeah the Grinch as well Jim Carrey's uh, oh god what was his name what was his name he was the director there uh, Ron Howard the the red hair. yeah Ron Howard uh, yeah I might take a shot at that for Christmas too uh, yeah I've never really done anything for Christmas time before well that's and, yeah you just can't go wrong with Home Alone, really, can you? No, no, not at all. No. Um, God, you've said a lot of great things. I don't think there's any other tips or tricks or anything you could recommend. You said that already. Um, God, there's really nothing else movie-wise. I mean, we went through this, that, and the other. Um, God, you're just... Ladies and gentlemen, Pogo, this guy's amazing check out his work i'll link you all his social his youtube you gotta check him out this guy is phenomenal and i l- just had a great time talking with him today so thanks for coming on absolutely mike yeah thanks so much man i've had a really really good time talking with you hey especially about movies i think we've got a lot in common there oh yeah for sure <laughs>